and welcome to The Daily Space. I am your host, Beth Johnson, and I am here to put science in your brain. Pamela is dealing with all of the noisy events happening at her house today between leaf blowers and furniture delivery, and it's all happening right when we normally record, so I'm flying solo. Later on the show, I'll be joined by Annie Wilson for a brief discussion of our first book club selection, Packing for Mars by Mary Roach. But first, the news. Today's news starts us off considering dust. We all see it build up in our house if we don't dust enough. And really, who has time for that? This is nothing compared to the outside world, however. Growing up, it always mystified me that enough dust and dirt fell out of the air to somehow, over time, completely bury ancient civilizations. As an adult, I now know that plants are taking nutrients from the air and soil and converting them into structures fully capable of burying my flower beds in three inches of leaves. I know dust blown from deserts and ash exploded out of volcanoes can all travel the world, layering grit on every surface in depths ranging from dustings to many inches. What I didn't know until today was that 5,200 tons of space grit makes it to the surface of our world every year. 5,200 tons. We knew, based on the number of streaks seen across the sky, that our world is regularly hit by a lot of space rocks. To determine how much material actually strikes the planet, researcher Jean Duprat traveled to the Franco-Italian Concordia station in the heart of Antarctica and collected samples from the snow in a site where there would be a near absence of terrestrial dust. By assuming that what was collected in Antarctica is representative of what fell everywhere in the world, they were able to calculate the worldwide dust fall of dust from space. The grains they found ranged from 30 to 200 micrometers, and it appears that 80% of the material comes from comets and the remainder comes from asteroids. So now you know, when your car is filthy, you can blame air pollution, pollen, ash, dust, and space dust. As much as you, I, and most people may have a special dark place in our heart for the dust we are forever having to clean, dust in space is actually a really good thing. In a pair of new papers appearing in Science Advances, researchers have been able to track how carbon dust goes from the clouds of space to being an integral part of life on Earth. According to researcher Mark Hirschman, lead author of one of the two stories, Most models have the carbon and other life essential materials such as water and nitrogen going from the nebula into primitive rocky bodies. And these are then delivered to growing planets such as Earth or Mars. But this skips a key step in which the planetesimals lose much of their carbon before they accrete to the planets. Put another way, we imagine these great clouds of material collapsing to form a star and its surrounding planets. And this is likely true. But we have to remember those forming planets and the stuff they form from is all baked by their young sun. And some materials, including carbon and water, get blasted off of them. To get to worlds like Earth, rich in carbon, they assumed the carbon had to be locked away in the cores of these forming worlds. Worlds like Earth, where it couldn't be blown away. The lead author of the second paper, Jackie Lee, puts it this way. We asked how much carbon you could stuff in the Earth's core and still be consistent with all the constraints. These studies found that worlds really need to start with a lot of carbon to get to keep enough carbon to eventually support life. Sure, meteors and comets that formed farther from a sun will bring us some of the carbon we need, but it may be that to get a world with a carbon cycle that supports life, you really need to start with planet forming objects that hide their carbon in their cores. This work and much of the work on this topic is being done using computer models that make assumptions about the compositions of asteroids. We can see rocky surfaces, we can make assumptions about asteroid structures, but to really understand what they are made of, we need to see inside. Luckily, some asteroids like the often discussed Bennu have been shattered often badly enough that their surface is a mix of rocks that once used to be on the inside. 
The asteroid Didymos is thought to be another one of these rubble pile asteroids, and the European Space Agency is planning to send a pair of missions to this world to first try and move its moon, and then to see the outcomes of that attempted push. One of the confusing aspects about how Didymos is held together, this is a tiny asteroid and it is spinning around its axis every couple of hours. If Didymos is made of a bunch of boulders, it should have flung itself apart. Researchers led by Yun Zhang tried to figure out what could be gluing these boulders together by running a series of computer models to see if the electrostatic forces of dust could do the trick. And you know what? It turns out that if you cake in enough dust, you can actually glue a pile of boulders into an asteroid. Personally, I find the science in this paper pretty cool, but the press release we received totally hid the science from the title, instead focusing in on who was the last author on the paper, Dr. Brian May. Known for his involvement in a little band called Queen, this researcher at the London Spectroscopic Company added in the creation of the 3D models the work used. It turns out, if you're famous enough for something unrelated to your research, even a last author can find their way into a press release. After the break, we're going to move on from dust and take a look at water on Mars. Don't go away. While much of the press is focused on Perseverance and its little helicopter ingenuity, NASA's Mars Curiosity rover continues to study and explore the Martian surface. In a new study published in the journal Geology, a team of researchers has analyzed images from Curiosity's ChemCam instrument. These images were taken with the telescopic imager and they have an unprecedented resolution for the Martian rovers. Curiosity is currently exploring Mount Sharp, the central sedimentary peak within Gale Crater, Curiosity's home base really, and an impact crater from early in our solar system's history, about three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago. Mount Sharp is 5.5 kilometers high, and it preserves an early record of Martian history that geologists have been waiting to study for years. With these new images, those geologists have finally had their chance, and what they found shows far more climate change than predicted. We've talked here before about how there was water on the surface of Mars, possibly even a small ocean, and then that water disappeared. Earlier studies discussed the possibility that the water had evaporated and escaped the atmosphere due to the lower gravity, while recent studies now show that the water is more likely trapped underground in minerals and even subsurface glacial deposits. But what were the conditions that led to the change in the state of the water? Did it all disappear at once or over time? This new paper examined these recent images and found amazing sedimentary structures in detail that led the team to conclude that there were multiple transitions between a wet climate and a dry climate. Per the press release, moving up through the terrain, Curiosity observed the types of bed changed drastically. Lying above the lake deposited clays that form the base of Mount Sharp, sandstone layers show structures indicating their formation from wind formed dunes, suggesting long dry climate episodes. Higher up still, thin, alternating, brittle, and resistant beds are typical of river floodplain deposits, marking the return of wetter conditions. A reminder that we are using a robot on another planet to analyze that planet's geology down to the details in the layers of different types of rock. These kinds of details are the stuff of sedimentologists' dreams and I have heard many professors and students gush over them in pictures and in the field during my geology coursework. And we are getting to see them and explain them and understand them on Mars. The other neat thing about this study is that it uses ChemCam in a way I hadn't heard about before. I didn't know it had a telescopic camera. I'm mostly familiar with it being the instrument that vaporizes rock fragments with a laser beam and then analyzes the plasma to get the composition of the rock. That's one of the ways we know that the rocks in this area are primarily mudstone and sandstone. Those two types of rock alone would be enough to say there was at least one wet period and one dry, but to get in there and see the actual thin layers alternating, amazing stuff. 
The plan now is for Curiosity to keep climbing the foothills of Mount Sharp and drill into the various beds to get an even closer look at the materials that make up these layers. I'll be back in a moment to talk about muons and the standard model of particle physics and how things might have just broken. Stay tuned. Any of you who have been watching this show for a while know that Pamela kind of adores the standard model of particle physics and is amused every time some complex theories, theorized particles fail to be found. Researchers know the standard model is incomplete. While it was able to successfully predict a number of particles, including the top quark and the Higgs boson, it doesn't actually explain why the physics we have has to be the way it is instead of being something totally different. It's like Kepler's theory of planetary motion. It could accurately predict planetary motion, but didn't explain why the planets did what they did. And it took Newton's theory of gravity to explain the why, and Einstein's relativity to fill in all the details before we could get a mostly complete theory. So with the standard model, we have a base that works and just doesn't explain the whys, but still seems to work or at least it did until this week. An experiment at Fermi National Accelerator Lab to look at unstable particles called muons. Muons are in many ways similar to electrons, but are 200 times bigger and tend to fall apart into smaller particles and energy over time. Muons are naturally produced when cosmic rays hit Earth's atmosphere and in other events where high energy particles crash into things that slow them abruptly. Particle accelerators like Fermi can produce muons in large numbers. And recent research to look at how these muons interact in magnetic fields discovered they don't do exactly what was predicted. Just like magnets can affect the motions of electrons, they can also affect muons. These are super similar particles. The fact that we understand electrons so well is part of how we can make amazing electronics. Because muons are unstable, they are harder to study and we're still confirming they also do exactly as predicted. In fact, it appears that there is something hanging out undetected that is affecting muons behavior. This could be new forces, new effects, or just some underlying feature of the universe. We don't know. What we do know is Fermilab wasn't the only place to get these results. Fermilab's experiment was actually a follow-up to a 2001 experiment at Brookhaven that had enough error in the measurements and was weird enough that it had to be replicated to be trusted. Fermilab and Brookhaven's results are in agreement, and now we know muons are reacting to something we know nothing about. This is super cool. This is like when observers realize Mercury's orbit doesn't exactly do what Newton or Kepler predicted. It was close, but not perfect. And the difference pointed us in the direction of what was needed and allowed Einstein to know he was on the right path with relativity. This new result is one new thing that says which set of equations need modification and tells us what kind of results those modifications should match. This is new information. We had an incomplete theory. We haven't succeeded in figuring out what's missing on our own, and now we have data. Annoying, not matching predicting data, and that is awesome. We really look forward to the day someone says, this is what was missing. After the break, I'll be back to review Mary Roach's Packing for Mars with Annie Wilson. Stay tuned. All right, everyone, welcome back. With me now is Annie Wilson, whom you all know from Rocket Roundup. She also founded a book club for CosmoQuest on Goodreads, and our first book was Packing for Mars by Mary Roach which Annie did some, uh, what, one discussion on last week? One discussion because life happens. But uh, yeah, it, we we had a couple people join. Um, next time I will give people more warning than just a week. But yeah, it was a really good discussion. So Annie, this was your book selection. I got the next one. Um, what What was your, why did you pick the book? First everybody, everybody kept telling me that I needed to read Packing for Mars. And I don't know if it's because she talks about space toilets in there or if it's because um, I, it may have just been because she talks about space toilets. Prob probably the space toilets. Yeah. Probably the space toilets. Uh, yeah, I think it was the space toilets. But everybody's like, 
you should read it. You should read it. I've never read any of her stuff. Now I want to go read everything else she's written. Um, yeah, I was really, I was, I was deeply entertained, like for, for a book that was presenting a whole lot of research and science uh, done on a lot of different topics around space travel. Um, it was, it was very approachable, right? Like I, I blew through it. I think I read that book faster than anything I, I read at all during this pandemic, really. <laughs> Yeah, once I once I started reading, I just I couldn't really put it down. I think I blew through it in like a day. Yeah, it was. I think, it was I think a that was the same. Read. There, uh, there, there were definitely some uh, uh, deep dive topics that were that were fascinating, and some that were a little horrifying. Um, we won't talk about those here because no. we've talked about them before, yes. and I don't need to go through it again. No. Um, but as to the space toilets, what did you what did you learn that was new for you about space toilets? Um, not a whole lot. Oh no, wait. It was mm, mm. so it's kind of hard to talk about space toilets while keeping it clean, tasteful, <laughs> tasteful. tasteful. I think it's the way classy, classy. Yeah, okay. classy. It's hard to talk about um space toilets while keeping it classy. But I do remember that there was concern about uh, liquid waste elimination from those with indoor plumbing, so to speak. Ah, from 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 females, women. biologically biologically yeah. female. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and they wanted to test it by putting some nurses in the vomit comet which by the way nasa hates it when you call it that um and recording <laughs> and, we all call it that. and recording them expelling liquid waste and the nor nurses were rightfully horrified and said no so that didn't happen so instead no joke instead they got a liquid analog which i can't remember exactly what, what was in this liquid analog you know for human liquid waste and they took a gentleman who was very um furry hairy and they put it on his belly and recorded that wow <laughs> yes this was this I was can't make this, this also, stuff up wasn't this also the conversation that that you actually had a twitter exchange with mary roach over ho biologic holding samples in your fridge yes holding <laughs> biological samples in the fridge she she did that and this was before I knew of all the other science that science experiments she has done with her husband, which you just have to research those on your own. Um, but yeah, uh, I had read about the specimen she had kept in the fridge and I had tweeted to her like, my favorite human would be horrified. She's like, I think mine's still scarred. <laughs> That was pretty neat. Um, they also got into some of the solid waste discussion and, and that got into, Ooh, no, no, no. I mean, Let's just say there was, there was, there was talk of recycling involved. And, and I know like we got into this a little bit on like literally on Star Trek discovery this last season, there's actually like a whole scene that involves an apple. And he's all like, that's from, you know, that's made from human waste because we break it down at a molecular level and then we reshape it into something else. And, uh, that reminded me of the book. <laughs> yeah, they were going to form it into patties. And it also brought up, you know, a fascinating discussion about, you know, if we're going to be spacefaring creatures, we need to kind of adjust. There's going to be a disconnect between, you know, what's okay and acceptable and, you know, normal on Earth. Well, I won't say what normal, but okay and acceptable uh, that a lot of people are like, we can handle this on earth yeah. and what's going to be okay and acceptable and we can handle this in space on earth we really don't need to recycle our um solid waste like that we we right. don't but when in, you're in a place with limited resources and you can't just grow more food it may come down to recycling like that and yeah it's it's yeah it's not always going to be um, uh, uh, Martian potatoes. 
No. Uh, <laughs> I still say use it as a building material. Apparently it's fantastic for blocking radiation. I would believe that. And I mean, it's not that far off from, from contemplating something like Adobe, right? That's sort of the same thing. Yeah. Mud with straw mixed in and there you go. It's, yeah. It solidifies pretty easily. So um, I know we're, we're kind of running out of time here. So um, what, what, was, what was your favorite anecdote of the book that you can relate here? Because there are probably some that, that aren't necessarily on the family friendly side. Sorry, parents, this might not be a, this is not a, a book for younger children. You this want is this not, to be no, this is not a book for younger children. I would recommend this to children that can handle um, conversations about reproduction because reproduction is talked a little bit about in the book. Um, because if you're going to colonize someplace, you have to be able to make more humans. Right. So human reproduction. Um, and I mean, everybody's going to giggle at the toilet stuff. We're all. There's also there's also discussion of, of death in space. So. Right. Right. I always forget that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, if if you want to have this, don't listen to the audiobook with kids where you're not comfortable talking about the how humans are made and how we deal with our dead um so that may vary family to family um but one of the things that i really enjoyed in the book was keep in mind this was written before that really high altitude jump for red bull but a right, lot of right the, a lot of the material is still i mean it's historical and pretty much everything still applies so there's not a lot of talk of, I don't remember there being a lot of talk of SLS or Artemis, or I don't think there was a lot of talk of SpaceX. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, things like the Vomit Comet. The fact that she got to go on the Vomit Comet and she went with a school group, uh, by school group, I mean college group, that was going, going to research. do an experiment. Yeah. And something, I think there's their experiment had to do with welding in <laughs> one of the welds on the thing that would have kept their stuff like connected to the bottom of the plane broke and they were all like it's not my weld yeah i was deeply amused by that they did they did obviously get their experiment onto the plane it just took a little extra so yeah I, I really I uh, really enjoyed uh, some of the the historical interviews that she she had. She went she did so much research for this. I mean, it was really impressive all the places that she traveled and went to different museums. But the fact of of getting to talk to some of the the cosmonauts um, in the early space program, oh in, yeah, from the Soviet Union was amazing. I thought that was just really cool. The stories that she got out of them, and I bet. I bet with a little bit more vodka, you could get some really deeply amazing <laughs> stories off the record. So um, I I really liked all of that. The historical side of it was pretty neat to me. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed excellent selection. I, I, I would give that a four out of five solidly and yes. maybe closer to four and a half for me. Like that was really good. I'm, so. I'm thankful to everyone who's like, you should read this book. So <laughs> thank you I'm for glad being I, like, read yeah. the book. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad that we did the book club and it pushed us into both reading it because it's been on my list for years as well. So I'm glad I finally sat down and actually got to do it. So our next book um, that we've started this month in April is The End of Everything, Astronomically Speaking by Dr. Katie Mack. Uh, we're, I'm looking forward to that one. I actually have a copy, I have a physical copy of it. So I'm actually going to sit down and start reading that one this weekend. So um, I think there's, our book club is on... Uh, Goodreads. So mm -hmm. if you just search for Cosmo Quest, you can find our book club there and feel free to join us. And uh, we have, we're basically doing a book a quarter because all of us have lives and we don't want to turn this into work. We want it to be fun. Right. So come join us, come read our books and come participate in discussions. We'd like to get this to be kind of a bigger community activity. So thank you, Annie, for joining me to talk about it, especially so last minute. I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, everybody, this has been The Daily Space. Uh, join us again next week. Pamela will be back. 
and we will be bringing you all of the space science. As a reminder, you can find more information on all of our stories, including images at dailyspace.org. And we're here thanks to the donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX.